morning, Woodlands Church. Happy New Year to all y'all joining us in the room, watching online, watching in the chapel. It's so good to worship with you in our first service of 2021. Will you stand and join us in singing this morning? You are 
You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're This next song uh, is a new one we're going to be singing around Woodlands as we, uh, Brian has mentioned, a series that we're going to be jumping into through the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, this song is taken right out of that, right out of the words of Jesus. Uh, and this song is a prayer for us as a church to sing together. It's not one of those songs where it's just about uh, us as individuals singing to God, but it's actually us as a church together asking God to teach us what it means to follow him to live according to his word because the kingdom is his. He is our king. He is our God. All glory and power and dominion belong to him. Amen? Amen. So this is a song called Yours is the Kingdom. Let's sing it together. Teach me to love you, O oh my God, with all of my heart and my soul. For whom have I in heaven or earth, none but you alone. Help me love my neighbor more than I love myself. Yeah. 
Jesus, with one voice, we declare that to you. Yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. So God, teach us more of what it means to follow you today. For you are our king and there is no other. So God, if there are any idols in our hearts this morning, we ask that you would do away with those. Get rid of them and allow us to worship you in spirit and in truth. Not just in the songs that we sing, but in the lives that we lead. Because God, in the things that we do, in the way that your spirit works in us, God, your kingdom is spread and your kingdom uh, breaks into this world in little ways, uh, in our homes, in our friendships, in our relationships, in our marriages, in our jobs. We beg you, God, that your kingdom would continue to break into each and every one of those areas of our lives. So we love you and pray all of this in your name and all God's people said, amen. You can have a seat. Good morning again, everyone. My name is David Hansen. I'm part of the staff team here at Woodlands Church. Happy New Year. So as I've been putting together my spiritual growth plan, I have been trying to figure out what song am I going to include in it this year, and I try to do that every year. I just found my song. Thank you, worship team. So if you're new to Woodlands Church, whether you're watching online or you're here in the auditorium or chapel, we're really grateful that you're here. And we would encourage you to text CONNECT to 888-225-7675. If you're in the building, we'd love it if you'd stop at the info center. After the service, there's a host who would love to meet you, but also we have a gift for you. Discover Woodlands is going to happen two weeks from today, so Sunday, January 17th at 1130. Those of you who are relatively new to Woodlands Church, we'd love to join you and uh, fill you in a little bit about what this place is about, answer your questions, but also several of us from the staff team will get an opportunity to get to know you, so we encourage you to participate in that. If you could, let us know that you're going to come. You can sign up in the app or using the website, or you can text DISCOVER to the number on the screen. On Thursday, January 14th, we have our fourth Red, Cl Red Cross blood drive that we've done since March. It has been vital as we serve our community because there is significant need. So again, if you'd love to be a part of that, if you can, we'd love to have you be a part of it. Uh, we would ask, though, that you would sign up. You can go to what's happening on the website or use our app to sign up for that event and it meets a critical need in our community. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, as we continue this morning and open up the word, uh, we pray that you'd use Pastor Brian to move in the hearts of each of us through the power of your spirit, that we would be people who desire to know you, Jesus, in a much deeper way. I pray, Father, that um, our time together this morning would be an encouragement for those who walk in here weary. Uh, we pray that uh, today would be one of those reminders that you, Jesus, are our hope, and we desperately need you. We love you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, good morning, and like David, I want to wish all of you a happy new year. Hope you had a good time uh, over the holidays with your family and friends and got some 
refreshment. Uh, hey, before we dive into the word, two things. Uh, one, especially for you online folks, uh, I know you have the option to leave the service whenever you want to. Uh, so I just want to encourage you to stick around till after the last worship song for two reasons. Uh, we've had two families in our church in the last five days that have been through pretty tragic deaths in their families. And we want to pray for them, and we encourage you to be part of that brief time of prayer. And then also, I want to share a personal challenge that I'm facing in the new year that I would appreciate your prayers for at the end of the whole service. So uh, if you'd stick around for that, that'd be great. The second thing I want to say before we dive in is this. Uh, if you're ever wondering, maybe you're not, but if you ever wonder, so how do, how do you decide as a pastor what sermons to preach or how does Woodlands do sermons and services? Usually they're planned out well in advance or we kind of lay out a preaching calendar, a worship calendar months in advance. And I actually stick to that pretty regularly. It's, it's a rare occurrence when uh, I change that calendar because I tend to pray a lot about it and ask God to show us what we need to think about as a church. But back in November, I had something scheduled for this particular Sunday, but back in November, reading in Woodlands in the Word, I came to the passage that we're going to be studying this morning, and it was one of those special whispers from God moments where I felt like the Spirit of God said, set aside what you were going to talk about. This is the text of Scripture that Woodlands needs to hear. Now, I didn't hear an audible voice, and I'm not infallible, but I had a strong sense that God wanted us to hear the text that we're going to think about today. So I'm excited to be able to share it with you this morning. Um, think of it this way. You know, when your computer doesn't work, or your phone doesn't work, or your smart TV doesn't work, or anything that has some computer settings to it, what does everyone tell you to do when it's not working right? It says, just restart it, right? And sometimes if it's really not working and you've restarted it five or ten times, then the nuclear option is to press reset. Reset takes everything back to the factory settings. You lose all your data, but it's the, the chance that you have to take your device uh, back to the factory settings and hopefully align it up again with the original, original vision of how your phone, your iPad, your computer, etc. were to work. I want to take you to a passage of scripture this morning that is a reset for us as a church. This is a reset passage. We're heading into a new year, and this is the passage that kind of lays out the original vision of what we should look like as a church. And truth be told, not just not Woodlands in particular, but the church in 2020 has drifted significantly from this vision. So it's time for us to press reset. And that's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to ask God to do that for us. We're going to ask him to press reset in each of our lives to bring us back to the original vision of what he intended his church to be. So if you have your Bibles, I invite you to open to Ephesians chapter 4, the passage that's going to enable us to press reset. As you're turning there, I want to remind you that uh, what our purpose statement is as a local church. We say that our purpose is to be, to be a Christ-centered community. That's who we are. Helping people faithfully follow Jesus. That's what we do, both globally and locally. That's where we do it. Those are the two fronts on which we do it. What I want to focus on this morning, what this passage focuses on, is... The first phrase, to be a Christ-centered community. It's focusing on what does that look like? What should the church be like? What should we be acting like, living like? What should be important to us? What should we value more than other things? So we're going to focus on that first clause. We're going to press reset through the book of Ephesians. Before we jump into chapter 4, I want to remind you that Ephesians is the book of the Bible that more than any other book was given to us by God to know what a local church should look like. This is the book that is about the church. It's what's called a circular letter. It was meant to be read by churches throughout the ancient world, and it is extraordinarily logically designed by God who inspired it. The first three chapters, there's not a single command in the book. In the, in the first three chapters, it's just all a vision. This is the church. This is what Christ has done for us. This is what he's achieved for us on the cross. Ephesians chapter 1 and Ephesians chapter 3 have probably two of the best New Testament prayers 
that we could pray for each other as a church. And both those prayers are basically, they, they are basically praying, God, help us as a church to see and to be. Help us to see who you've made us to be and help us to be that. Press reset for us. Take us back to the original setting. That's what the Apostle Paul, who God inspired to write this book, was praying. Help the local church there in Ephesus and in Philippi and Colossae and all those ancient cities. Help them to, when they read this letter, press reset and say, oh, this is what the church should be like. And then in chapter 4, he says, so now that you've seen what Christ has done, here's what you should be. So this morning we're going to look at four marks of a healthy church, a reset church, the original vision. So let's dive into Ephesians chapter 4. Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love. Let's stop right there. We're going to take a slow walk through this text. The first mark of a healthy church is when it is filled with people who are marked by character. Christian character. The character of Christ. Look at how he begins in verse 1. He says, I implore you, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the one you follow. Walk in a manner worthy of the one who died for you. Walk like a Christ follower should walk. Not like a person of your culture. Not like a person who uh, thinks they've got it all figured out, but walk like a Christ follower. Look to Christ as your model. And then he picks four character qualities that we are to focus on as a church in this reset passage. He says this, with all humility and gentleness and patience, tolerating one another, or some versions translate it, bearing with one another in love. So just stop. How did you do this year at that? What was your quotient of humility, gentleness, patience, and lovingly bearing with and tolerating other people? How did that go for you this year? I know I didn't probably get an A on that this year. So I want to press reset in my life. And I think we as a church should come back to this original vision. These are incredible characteristics when you look at them. Humility. You know, walk with humility toward one another. Gentleness. Act gently with each other. Treat each other cautiously, carefully, kindly. Patience. Walk slowly with people through life. Don't grow impatient or irritated or angry, bearing with one another, tolerating each other in love. One of the interesting things, the three things to notice about those four words is how do you know if you're doing that? How do you know if Christian character, as it's described in these four words, how do you know that that's you? You know where you'll know it. You'll know it in your relationships. You'll know it in how you express disagreement on Facebook. You know it in the kind of conversations that you have with people. You'll know it in how well you do at maintaining friendships and working through problems instead of quickly moving to critiquing and condemning other people. That's how you'll know it. It's in the relational arena. Notice also that they are, if you look closely at the text, that they are two couplets. The, ver- the characteristics are organized together with all humility and gentleness. Those two go together. Hum- if you're humble toward other people, if you don't think of yourself as better than other people, then you will tend to be gentle with them. If you see that you have the same potential to be... Can I say this word in church? Maybe I won't say it. An idiot. A jerk as anybody else, if you see that you and believe that you have the same potential to act like that as anybody else, maybe that'll help us all be a little more gentle with each other. If you genuinely believe that you don't always get it right, that you don't always react in the best way, if you walk with humility before others, then that will enable you to be gentle. So he says, with all humility and gentleness. And the second one is, then with patience showing tolerance and love. In other words, patiently 
over the long haul, bearing with the failures, the weaknesses, the foibles of other people without being quick to condemn or quick to reject. The third thing I want to point out in this little list of four character qualities is, in my humble opinion, humility is probably the most important. I know that love is the cardinal Christian virtue. Yes, I understand that. But I think to be able to love people diligently, you really have to believe deeply in your soul four words. You have to be able to say these four words regularly in your relational arena and actually believe them in your heart. Oh, you can say them, but if you don't believe them, it doesn't really do you much good. These are magic words. In lots of conversations, if you just say these four words, I could be wrong. Don't you wish you heard that more often this year when people express their opinions toward each other? Well, here's my opinion, my sister, my brother, my friend, my neighbor, my political opponent, but I could be wrong. I don't have it all figured out. What a great, what, what an incredible characteristic it is to walk through life saying, but I could be wrong. You know, I like to say that if I could pick two characteristics that I wish would mark Woodland's church, they would be humility and graciousness. Humility and graciousness. That we would be gracious with people because we would believe deeply that we're all part of the same human race. We all are prone to failure. We're all going to mess up. We're all going to make mistakes. So instead of jumping on the critique bandwagon, let's be humble and say, you know what, I could be wrong. That if, you, if you just fell badly there, but for the grace of God, go I. We have to keep telling ourselves that. So with all humility and gentleness, I could be wrong. You know, this year has revealed some serious defects in Christian character. If you've ever had someone in your family who has Alzheimer's, you know that Alzheimer's can alter behavior. It can alter character. Kathy's mom, uh, a dear, sweet woman of God who was an incredible model of Christian character to me and her dad as well, May Satterthwaite, uh, was one of the sweetest, you know, Christian women I know. And then she got Alzheimer's. And she lived with us for over a year. And there were many days when she was just mean. She was mean to our daughter. She was mean to her daughter. That wasn't May. That was Alzheimer's. I think there are many Christians who somehow got sucked into the vortex, the chaos of this year, and have, their Christian character has been not what it should be. Listen to a couple other passages of Scripture. Look at where Ephesians chapter 4, which is a long discussion on Christian character, by the way. Look at where it ends in verse 30. It says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So how do you grieve the Spirit of God? Well, he goes on to tell us how not to grieve God's Spirit who indwells us. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 2 is all the good things. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 31 is all those things we shouldn't do. There's been way too much of verse 31 in the Christian church at large this year. And then he goes on in verse 32 and says, But instead, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also forgave you. That's the Christian character that God wants to see in us. Or consider this other text of Scripture from James chapter 3. There is a haunting question in James chapter 3. Just listen to it. James chapter 3 verse 8 says this. Who can tame the tongue? It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. Here comes the question. With it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. I should say it's not a question statement. With it, we bless our Father, and with it, we curse men who've been made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come both blessing and cursing. And then here's the statement. Brethren, These things ought not to be this way. Woodlands, 
we ought not to come to church and worship God with our mouths and then go out into our world and angrily, bitterly criticize, put down, gossip about, slander against, pronounce judgments on other Christians because they're different than we are. So let's press reset and let's come back to Christian character. You know, I am incredibly proud of and challenged by my own son, Steve, who's on staff here in this regard, because one of the things that you will do if you walk humbly is you will listen to other people. And one of the things that has divided the Christian church has been our response to the racial stuff that's happened in our country. And one of the things that my son Steve did, I I don't even do this, but I give him a lot of credit for doing it, he just regularly chooses to listen to podcasts by African Americans about culture and race simply because I says, he said, I want to enter into their experience. If you're going to be a humble Christian Christ follower, you have to listen well to other people. Humbly, gently, patiently bearing with one another in love. That's the mark of a healthy church, number one. Second one is this. Let's read on in verse three of Ephesians chapter four. Being diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There's one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. The second mark of a healthy Christian church when you press the reset button, is it's unified. There's unity there. Do you see how he shifts from character, be humble, gentle, patient, lovingly bearing with each other toward his very strong command. Be diligent, verse 3. In other words, bring energy to preserve, not to create. You don't have to create unity. God created it for us. You just have to preserve it. How do you preserve it? You preserve it by what he does in the text. You preserve it by choosing to focus on all the things that unite us. Be diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace, he says, because there is over all of us one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Look at the list again there of the things that he draws to our attention, count them up, one body, one spirit, one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father. You know how many there are? There are seven. Remember in the scripture, seven is the word that is, stands for God in scripture. It's the word that signifies perfection. This is a, a calling us back to these huge things that unite us. And if you look at the list, there, there are two parts to it of this list of seven things. One part of it is he simply mentions the three persons of the Trinity. The Spirit, the Lord Jesus Christ, and one God and Father of all who is over all. So this is a Trinitarian statement. He's saying, fight for the unity that Christ died for you to stand in by remembering that you are all under this one triune God. You have the same spirit in you that dwells in your brother or your sister that you may disagree with. You have the same Lord that you are following, that they're following. You belong to him just as they belong to him. They are your brother and your sister. And you have one God and Father who planned and orchestrated and brought to fruition your salvation. And you would be lost without him. And so would your brother or your sister. You have that that unites you. You also have one baptism, one entrance into the Christian faith, one hope of your calling, one eternity. You know, you have the faith. When he says one faith, that means the body of truth, the bigger doctrines that we all believe. There's so much that unites us. And he takes us through this list of things that we all have in common. An ancient Christian writer said, summed up the Christian faith like this. He said, we should live our lives this way in essentials. These essentials, we have unity. In non-essentials, charity. In non-essentials, graciousness. 
in non-essentials, allowing each other to have our differences. I love the association of churches that we are a part of. Some of you who are a little bit newer to Woodlands might think that we are just an independent church. We are not. We are not part of a denomination. We don't like to call ourselves a denomination, but there are well over a thousand of us in the Evangelical Free Church of America, our association of churches. We call ourselves an association because there's not a lot of hierarchical, ecclesiastical authority over us. Each independent, each local church is pretty independent in that sense, but we work together around a common purpose, common statement of faith, and one of the taglines of the EFCA that I love is, we major on the majors and we minor on the minors. We don't fight over the non-essentials. We practice charity toward other people. We recognize that we as an association of churches don't have a corner on truth. And there are going to be people that come to us from all different backgrounds, and so that's who we are. This year, in 2020, we, the church, have taken our eyes, not necessarily Woodlands, but we, the church in general, have taken our eyes off these seven things that unite us. And we've talked about, focused on, shouted about, posted about our differences about the virus. Is it real or isn't it? Government's role in a pandemic, should they or shouldn't they have it? Authority of the government, schools and how to do them, race and racism and whether it even exists and how to handle it, masks and whether we should wear them, church services and whether or not we should have them. And then, of course, that little one, politics. And there's this huge body of things that unite us that he's laid out here so well that we should be focused on. And we should look around this room every time we come here and think, these are my brothers and my sisters. They may vote differently than I vote. They may have different opinions about schools. They may have different opinions about whether to watch church online or come. But these are my brothers and my sisters. And we have one God, one Father over all, one Lord, one faith, one... You know the list. So the mark of a healthy church is when people are willing to live graciously and humbly with differences with each other and stay united. That's the second set. We need to press reset on this one and come back to what's essential and important. There's a third mark of a healthy church is found in verses 7 and following. Let's read on. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives and he gave gifts to people. Now this expression, he ascended, what does it mean except that he had also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is himself also he who ascended far above all the heavens so that he might fill all things. And he, Jesus, gave some as apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. Before I give you the word that defines this third mark of a healthy church, I want you to notice the contrast that has happened in the text because we're building these marks, as we always try and do, out of the text of Scripture. Notice the change in verse uh, 3 through 6. He's talking about the things that we all have in common. There's a strong shift between verses 6 and verse 7 where he moves to talking about all of us have these, all these things in common. That's unity. But then he says in verse 7, but, now I'm going to change. I'm going to not talk about what we all have in common anymore. But to each of us, now I'm going to talk about you individually. Now I'm going to talk about God's unique work in your life and in your brother's life and your sister's life. I'm going to talk about not how we're the same anymore, but I'm going to talk about how we're different. Turn over to a parallel passage for a second to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 at verse 4. 
Here in a passage that is essentially saying the same thing, here's how it reads there. There are varieties of gifts, 1 Corinthians 12, 4. There, uh, there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. Varieties of ministry, but the same Lord. There are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. But to each one of us is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. Go back to Ephesians when he gives us this picture of Jesus descending from heaven to earth to die on the cross for us and then ascending, rising up, rising from the dead, going back to heaven. He's painting a word picture that the ancients would understand. In the ancient world, when a king went out to conquer, when he went out to fight and he conquered a city, when he conquered the city, he would loot it and then he would take the plunder of that city and he would make a triumphant march back into the city and he would distribute the plunder, the wealth to his people. That's the word picture that's here. Only Christ is the conqueror. And what he conquered is sin and death and the grave. And he rose from the dead. And when he rose from the dead, he sent his spirit to indwell us, his followers. And the spirit distributed gifts to all of us. Not wealth, not plunder, but talents and time and treasures, those things that we can use for the kingdom. So what's the third mark of a healthy church? It's engagement. It's when a a church has all of its people who are fully engaged in the mission of the church. That's what Paul is arguing for in this text of Scripture. He's saying, don't you see, church, that this is how God designed it? That Christ rose from the dead and to each one of us, not just to a few, But to each one of us, he gave spiritual gifts and spiritual talents so that we could all together be in the game, that we could be on the field of play as Christ followers. So i got to tell you, I love this this room. I hope you do too. I I love being able to, to speak in here. I just love worshiping in here. I look forward, not that I didn't look forward to worship before I did, but I really look forward to it in here just because I love the beauty of looking outside and everything else. I just love being here, but I have a little bit of a nervousness about this room. You know what it is? It feels like a football stadium. And you know what happens at a football game, right? There are seven, 70 players, essentially, on the field and 70,000 coaches who are telling the 70 on the play on the field what to do. I'm going to be a coach this afternoon at 3.30. Every Sunday it happens. I scream at the Packers from at my TV, why did you call that play? Why did you throw that? Why did you do that? Why? You know, so we all do that, right? It's okay with an entertainment like football, but it's not okay if we think the church is a few people on the stage or a few people in kids' ministry and all the rest of us just coming and kind of partaking. The church is to be fully engaged, every one of us. So in a healthy church, everyone is assessing their their gifts, their abilities, their talents, the experiences they have, the treasures they have, the time they have, and they're saying, how can I be engaged in ministry? How can I help the church of Christ move forward? Remember Jesus told us that, that parable that was meant to stick with us, the parable of talents? where he portrays himself as handing out, just like this text does as well, handing out talents or treasures or gifts, whatever you want to call them, to all people. And then going on a long journey, he rose from the dead, he's ascended to heaven, but he's going to come back. And in the parable of the talents, he's gone for a while, he comes back, and then he goes to individuals. It's an individual conversation when the king returns. And he says to one guy, what did you do with the five talents I gave you? I made five more. Awesome. What did you do with the two talents I gave you? I made two more. Awesome. What did you do with the one talent I gave you? Well, I buried it. I stuck it in the ground so that I wouldn't lose it. Do you remember what the parable said? Jesus said, you wicked slave, you wicked servant, why didn't you at least invest it? Why don't you just Take it and put it in the bank, to use the analogy. Just do a little something. Jesus is reminding us that he expects all of us in his church to not be a critic of the church, a critiquer of the church, but a player in the church to be fully engaged. Let's press reset and make sure that we're all in that that mode these days. 
One of my favorite stories about engagement in the local church and not being simply in the stands, but being on the field. And I'm sure I've told it before, but it's one of those stories that has shaped my life, so I'm going to share it again. It comes from a long time ago by, from a guy by the name of D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody was an evangelist in the mold of Billy Graham. He was one of the guys that helped start the mass evangelism movement. And when the mass evangelism movement filling stadiums and city arenas and tents and that sort of thing started happening, there were a bunch of people that thought it was wonderful and there were a bunch of people that criticized it severely. Even though people were coming to Christ, there were lots of critics of D.L. Moody. And I don't, know, I don't know, honestly, the mood of D.L. Moody when this event happened, but I'm gonna, I suspect that maybe he was a little tired of all the criticism. Just maybe. And one time another critic came and he said the same thing that D.L. Moody had heard so many times. I don't like the way you're doing evangelism. Evangelism is simply sharing your faith, helping other people follow Christ. That's what our purpose statement is. I don't like the way you're doing evangelism, referring to those big crowds and those tents and those mass gatherings. I don't like the way you're doing it. And maybe, just maybe, D.L. Moody was just a little exasperated at this point. And maybe, just maybe, he's just like, you know, maybe I am doing something wrong here. I mean, maybe I just need to listen to this guy. And so maybe he said, okay, uh, okay. <sighs> so tell me, maybe, I, maybe, I, maybe you can help me. Maybe you have a better way. I just want to see people come to faith in Christ. Maybe you have a better way. Maybe you can sharpen me. So just tell me, so how are you doing evangelism? And the guy's response was, well, I'm not doing evangelism, but I don't like the way you're doing it. And D.S. DS, D.L. Moody had one of those brilliant moments where he said this line. He said, well, huh. He said, I like the way I am doing evangelism better than the way you're not doing it. In other words, you're just a critic right now. You're just someone out in the stands who's not even in the game. I may not be doing it right, but I'm on the field. Ephesians chapter 4 is saying to us as a church, let's make sure we're all on the field and in the game. Let's press reset. There's a final healthy characteristic of a church, final mark of a healthy church. Let's read on in Ephesians 4, pick it up in verse 11. It says in verse 11, I'm going to start, read again some of what I've already read. He gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers. Just a representative sampling of some of the gifts. Other passages list others. Why did he give those gifts? For the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building of the body of Christ. Until and for the purpose of all of us attaining to the unity of the faith, the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature person to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, we shouldn't be children anymore. We shouldn't be tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. But we're to speak the truth to each other in love so that we can grow up in all aspects into him who is the head. It is from him, the head, Christ Jesus, that the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. So what's the final mark of a healthy church? It's maturity. A healthy church is filled with people who are not perfect and we're never going to arrive at perfection. The New Testament actually says that. But we're moving towards spiritual maturity. We're on a growth trajectory. He's, look, at what he, look at how he phrases that in verse 13. All those gifts that we all have, all those resources, time, talents, and treasures have been given to us so that we can work together until, verse 13, we all attain to the unity of the faith, the faith meaning the body of truth, till we all kind of get it spiritually and grow up spiritually until we all attain to maturity, verse 13, to a mature person, to the measure that is our standard, which is Christ. We should, become, we should be becoming more like him. 
on and on always in our life. So maturity, what does maturity mean? Well, certainly it means character. It means the four character qualities at the start of this text. It means being more humble. What does maturity mean? Well, certainly it means people who are committed to the unity of the church, who value the unity and and allow for diversity. What does maturity mean? Well, certainly it means that we're engaged, we're in the game. But it also means what this part of this text says, and that is that we are maturing in our understanding of who Christ is, his person, of what he's done on the cross, his work, of what he requires of us, his will. It means that we're growing in our understanding. You know, that's why I'm so excited about this new journey that we are on called the joyful journey that uh, David alluded to a little bit this morning. I'm excited that we're starting tomorrow to read through the four Gospels together between now and Easter, and I I trust and hope that most of you are going to do that with us. I'm excited about doing it myself, and one of the things is I form my spiritual growth plan that I'm going to do that I've never done before as I've read through the Gospels, is I have this, I always tell people the best study Bible on the market is the ESV study Bible, and I have one, and I use it from time to time, but I've never read all the notes on any particular book all the way through, so my goal is to read through these four Gospels between now and Easter and read all the notes, because every time I read the notes, I say, huh, I didn't know that, or or, huh, yeah, I forgot that. And it deepens me in my love for and appreciation of what Jesus has done. So I hope you'll be diving into the four Gospels with us as we go on this journey. I hope you'll be doing it with other people. I hope you'll go onto the website or on the app and look, click on that little thing that says dive deeper. It will guide you into how you can do what Pastor David just talked about a few minutes ago, form your spiritual growth plan. So that you can say, how can I intentionally do things that will move me toward maturity. What's that going to look like? So these are the four marks of a healthy church. Character, unity, engagement, and maturity. Let's pray that we become that kind of church, that we grow in all four of those areas. Let's press reset together in our individual lives to make sure that all of our reactions and inner reaction, interreactions with other people are marked by these four things. So join me as we pray together. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this magnificent vision of the church that you have laid out for us. Thank you for the privilege that we have to gather together as one people, united around the great essentials of the faith. I pray that as we head into a new year, I pray that in 2021 that we would continue to move as a local church toward health. Thank you that you've protected and guarded and blessed this church with lots of spiritual health, with a ton of good people who are marked by character, fully engaged, committed to unity, growing in their faith but we want to stay on that trajectory. We don't want any of us to wander off of it. So pray in 2021 that by your grace, we would move in this direction that you have given to us in your word. We pray in your name, amen. Amen, why don't you stand and join us in responding and uh, sing again. I cast my mind to Calvary Where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds, his hands, his feet My Savior on that cursed tree His body bound and drenched in tears They laid him down in Joseph's tomb The entrance sealed by heavy stone Messiah still and all alone
you as our one true God and King. Pray that you would sustain us this year, God, that you would grant us health as a church and as individuals. That, God, we would follow you with all that we have. Lord, together with one voice, we pray all of these things in your name and all of God's people said, amen. Thank you so much for joining us today, Woodlands Church. Uh, Brian's going to come back up and say one more thing. Be seated. Um, so uh, I want to share uh, just a personal health challenge I'm facing with you because it's going to take me out of uh, this role for a little while. So uh, the good news is I trust that I will be fine, so let's start there. And uh, the kind of issue that I have is very treatable, but uh, a little over a year ago I was, treated, I was diagnosed with prostate cancer. So uh, part of 2020 for me has been figuring out when to get that treated. If you know anything about this particular kind of cancer, it's slow growing. Uh, it's not particularly fatal. Uh, so if you treat it, catch it early and treat it uh, kind of aggressively, you're usually fine. I only had cancer in about a third of the biopsy, biopsy samples that they took, and it was a little bit less than average uh, aggressiveness, so it wasn't aggressive. So everybody, all the doctoral doctors and everybody have felt comfortable waiting uh, for a while to have surgery to remove the cancer, but that's going to happen on Tuesday. Uh, so I'm asking for you guys to pray about that for me and uh, praying that just the surgery goes well, that I can recover quickly, that it hasn't spread. That's the one risk, of course, with any kind of cancer is that it might have spread, but we don't think that's happened, but we, they won't know, actually, I guess, until they get in there on Tuesday. So, but people that uh, know about prostate cancer tell you that it takes about a good four weeks to recover, so I won't be around the church for the next four weeks. Uh, I'll be laying in oversized sweatpants and watching a lot of TV uh, or something like that. 
like that. And, um, and I would appreciate your prayers. So pray that they, they get all the cancer and pray that uh, the recovery goes well and quickly and that sort of thing. Kathy and I are doing fine. Um, we're, we're, we've dealt with this news for a while. We want, I wanted to get through the building program, wanted to get through the holidays. And, and I've had to, if I had to pick a month where I have to lay around for a month, apart from skiing, this is probably the best month to have to give up. So I won't be preaching again until the 14th of uh, February, Lord willing, uh, but I'd appreciate your prayers. Pastor David is going to come, uh, and he's going to pray uh, for the, can- the surgery that I'm going to have, and I'm going to pray for the two families. Uh, Stacy Borchard was a 45-year-old woman in our church who passed away this week. Huge shock, unexpected to her family, and Adam Cronquist was a young man in his 20s who died uh, this week of a blood clot. So we have two families that we've heard about in our church this week who are facing some very, very difficult grieving that they're going through. So David, where did you go? There you are. Come on up, and uh, we're going to pray together. I'm going to pray for those two families and ask you to join me, and then David's going to pray for what we're facing as a family. So let's pray. Jesus, our hearts grieve and hurt uh, for the Borcher family and for the Cronquist family. They received news this week that no family wants to receive, and their grief and their pain are immense, and yet they are not grieving without hope, but they're grieving with the hope of the gospel, but they're still grieving. Lord, as the, uh, as the funeral uh, for Stacy is held here this Tuesday, we pray that that would be a celebration of her life, a celebration of the gospel, a comfort to the family. We pray that for both these families that you would speak the kind of peace and the kind of hope and the kind of strength to their hearts that only you can speak. You know exactly the words that they need to hear in their hearts from you. And Lord, uh, just uh, we pray you'd carry them along. We pray for their family and friends who know them, that they would be able to provide good comfort and support and strength as these families go through these difficult days. So we lift them up to you and trust you to care for them well and help us as a church as well. This is why you plant local churches, Father, to care for people, and so help us to care for them well as well. And Lord Jesus, we come to you this morning grateful for Pastor Brian, that he's our pastor. We pray for he and Kathy as they head into Tuesday that you'd continue to give them peace and confidence in you. We pray for the surgical team, even today, that um, each person would be refreshed and go into Tuesday energized, that you'd give the uh, lead surgeon wisdom, uh, clarity, and I pray, Jesus, that um, they would be able to remove all the cancer We pray, Father, that uh, Pastor Brian would get a very good report on Tuesday. We are grateful that he doesn't go into that room alone. We are grateful instead that he goes into that room with the great physician, you, Lord Jesus. We collectively thank you for our pastor. And we ask for your richest blessing over he and Kathy and their family. Amen. Amen. Thanks, David. Thank you, everyone. Have a great Sunday. It's good to be with you this morning. Longing for the coming day of 